is power about having great strength or having the courage to overcome great odds, to silence the doubt and the doubters, influencing others or believing in yourself. Is power about having the ability to imagine what comes next or an uncontrollable curiosity, standing together or being brave enough to stand alone? Is power having knowledge or just knowing who you are and what you have to give? Or is it an inner wisdom that comes with a long-held passion to learn everything about a subject just so you can improve it? At Rolls Royce, we recognize that power shows itself differently in different people. That's why, for us, our power is our difference and our difference is you. Good afternoon, evening, morning, I think it is all. How are you doing? It is indeed. I'm very well. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm brilliant. And welcome everybody who has joined us today for this Power Series session on collaboration. Um, my name is Manisha Mystery. I'm the Portfolio Director of uh, Culture and Collaboration at Rolls-Royce and R Squared Data Labs. Um, and Arv, who are you? My name is Arvind. Uh, I'm a storyteller at Rolls-Royce and specifically Oscar Data Labs. Um, storyteller is one of those words that is nice to hear. No one knows what it means. My grandma asked me as well. Uh, it touches a little bit on everything, a little bit about marketing, uh, internal comms. It talks about propositions. It talks about essentially how we pull together everything we do into a nice, neat story. So it gives us purpose and vision, uh, but also explains why we're doing it to the outside world. So that's who I am. I like it. I like it. I didn't explain who I am. I just gave a job title. So you've totally already <laughs> co exed me there. Um, so we're going to run this as a conversation and you're almost the fly on the wall of that. So apologies if we go into our normal casual way. It's just how we are. Um, but we'll hopefully bring a little bit of life to what collaboration means for us as individuals for our organization, how we bring that to life. And then more importantly, some of our work, can you remember that time when? Because I think bringing it to life through stories is really important. So it's great again that we've got our events <laughs> to join me on that. So you can do that. Um, do put things in the chat though. We'd love to make sure that our, our conversation answers any questions that you have to, um, and we'll happily try and feed them in as we go. So I think to start, we should probably explain a little bit about Rolls-Royce and who our Square Data Labs are, maybe. So, Aaron, do you want to have a go at starting that ball rolling? Yeah, very happy to. Um, so most of you guys will know who Rolls-Royce are. Um, we're massive in civil aerospace, defence, power systems. What we focus on is essentially the power that matters. So that's all about how do we make sure that people are powered and empowered. Ask with Data Labs focuses a lot on achieving that through AI, machine learning, emerging tech, and is the data innovation catalyst of Rolls Royce. So that means we work with Rolls Royce, but also external companies to help them achieve on their targets using emerging tech such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. So for us, it's very much a tool to achieve a higher purpose. And what the higher purpose is, depends on who we work with. So for Rolls Royce, it could be one aspect. For some of the other companies we work with, it could be something else. Um, our team specifically focuses on two things. Um, there is the technical capability, where I just mentioned around in instances, AI, ML, but then there's also the people element, and that's super important to us, the culture, and that stands out so much. And it's actually Manisha who's the leader of that, and she's been recognized with an award last year for putting that into Rolls Royce. Um, it's been a long journey and she's been the charter manager of the year and she won that exactly for putting that program in. And we've seen tremendous uh, improvements in how our people work with each other, how they collaborate inside the organization, how they draw on support from outside the organization, and then what that means for, for the company itself. So what I'm talking about is like 
our innovation cycles, the time it takes to innovate to something is a lot shorter. Um, how we work is a lot more pleasant. Um, we're getting a whole vast array of ideas that we never tapped into before because we didn't think about the diversity of thought. Um, and that is pretty much because we've opened ourselves up and we've started to talk externally, but we've also started to listen. And that's super important. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are. That's I don't want to bore you guys to death. <laughs> it's a it's an exciting space to be in, actually, and I think oh, you captured it really well with that balance of artificial intelligence, technology, future thought leading in terms of where we're going in that kind of amalgamation of we're we're augmenting people, right? We're, we're not saying that technology will replace humans, but actually how do we build the best a human is and add superpowers to them? And I guess when I think about my role, when I am leading some of the interventions we do around culture and collaboration, I always think of collaboration as very much a big part of that as a, we all come as unique people. We all come as um, having a secret source, a secret mixture that makes us able to do certain things maybe better than others or other things where we find difficult. And collaboration is actually about harnessing all those amazing good things that we do and pulling them through. But at the same time, allowing space, and that's why I think your point around environment is really crucial here, Arv, is that it's about making space where people can allow those areas where they're not so good to, to not disappear, but to not have to be at the front, to, to be able to take that time to learn to cultivate those or get other ideas and inspirations of how to build those further forward. But the fact that their key skill is what's being brought to the fold is amazing because you amplify. Collaboration is all about amplification. And that has been always the case for Rolls-Royce and particularly within R squared for where we work. And I'm just kind of thinking about our day to day. If I think about just what we were doing last week and maybe giving some insights to those that have joined today about a day in the life of would probably be quite useful because even though we're working in remote spaces and as individuals right now, um, it's incredible the level of collaboration is still taking place because of technology, because of devices and services like the one we're using just now. Um, and so I just wondered whether of you had a, a day in the life of that you'd love to share that kind of brings a little bit of that collaboration to life of how we do it in Rolls-Royce and elsewhere. I think that might be that might be quite useful. For anyone who knows about micro mimics and gestures, you just get the living daylights out of me because last week I had COVID and I can't remember what I did. <laughs> but I will try. Um, a day in the life of, uh, it's cliche to say no day is ever the same, but things move fast in what we do. So if I, if I actually take last week as an example, it stretches from looking at prospecting and looking at what do customers actually want who work with us in the AI ML space. There are typical challenges that they're always exposed to, not enough data, data is not in the right format, um, the leadership doesn't support them in the initiatives, that kind of stuff. So you start looking at, okay, what is it that um, we can help them with and how do we position ourselves to be an extension of their team? So how can we be a collaborator to their organization? At the same time, we also look at how do we get the support that we need. And one of the things that we do is we get other people to come and work in our teams. And that could be across different levels. We've got contractors, we've got interns, we've got um, grads, but it doesn't almost matter where they're from and what level they're at. It's we get the best out of them because we need it. We really need to succeed because we're pushing really hard on, on things like sustainability and uh, things that you've seen in the power series actually but on things that are very very difficult to push forward and actually make a dent and make a measurable impact so we need everyone um one thing that occurred to me when you said spaces was actually we don't know all the answers and we don't know what we might need in the future and the environment the spaces that you mentioned is something useful to me because you you plant a seed and then you let it grow but you don't know whether it's weeds or whether it's something something productive yet. And even in the weeds, there's still stuff hidden that you can harness later. So it's not necessary that it's all architecture in a way where you know, okay, I'm planting this, this is going to be rows, and that's the only thing I want to see there. You almost don't know what you're planting, but you know something that will come from it is being used and it will be useful. And that's the something that that's something that I really appreciate about what we have because 
you get the freedom to develop your own skills, what you're passionate about. And that's the bit that means that you're on your personal journey. And while you're on your personal journey, that overlaps with the journey that the business is on. So you're always pulling the business along with you. And as you benefit, the business benefits. And that's something that's incredible. So this week alone, we had eight interns join and just listening to them, hearing them speak, challenging, challenging us back in, hey, why do you actually do that? Why is it this way? Why don't you do it this way? It's incredibly rewarding. Um, that's that's something that I, I take this week. If I think about last week, there is, yeah, we had conversations, excellent conversations where it's about people thinking that the journey we've been on is something amazing and fascinating. Trust me, while I was on that journey, it didn't feel like we were moving much. But looking back at it, it feels like we can actually say, you know what, we've gone through this, we've come out the other end, and there are so many lessons learned that we now are prepared to share and we can take. There is the, so sometimes people are scared to collaborate and to share. And that often comes from getting getting the, the small end of the stick or for not getting an equal value. And something that's a personal thing to me is I almost don't care what I get in return because again, another cliche phrase is, is the journey, not the destination, but in going through these motions, I look at what I get out of it. And then it almost doesn't matter how much I share or what I don't share because if I add more value to someone else than it gives me back, then that's great. Fine. I get really happy, but I still got value as well. And that mindset is actually very important because oh, I, I need something more than the other person or, or I, they can't benefit more than I can. That, that kind of stuff is, I think, outdated. Nowadays, people are about mutual benefit and it's about understanding what that mutual benefit is and then making sure that you get a sweet deal, fine. But it's not necessarily in relation to the other person. It's not in, in relation to, oh, they mustn't get a better deal than I do. And that is something that's remarkable. And I see that in the next generation coming through. That's something I think is gives you hope. In a world where you hear loads of bad things, I think that gives hope and I really like that. No, that's brilliant. Um, I think uh, I can really reflect on that. What are you getting from the journey and are you understanding that? And sometimes it's really difficult because we all have jobs to do, right? We've all got a task or an outcome that we're trying to strive towards. And in a lot of cases, um, we can sometimes get lost in that. I need to just get the job done. I don't want to deal with all of the other bits that come around it. And collaboration is a very soft behavioral skill, actually, believe it or not. It's not as hard as and not as tangible as I think many consider it to be. But yet it's so important because actually it's what will get you to completing the tasks that you have. But you may never realize that you were going to go down the route that you did to get there. Because on, a, on an individual basis, when you think about things, you will have a perspective or a viewpoint of how to get there. And suddenly you'll have a throw of all sorts of things, which at the time could be just muddling, confusing, and it's like, I just, it's not helpful. When suddenly it's like, oh my God, it absolutely is, <laughs> because it's helping me to avoid X, Y, or Z. And I think what you've just said really made me kind of reflect on that, because We have had, actually we've technically had nine people start this week, uh, one of which was a graduate who was familiar with all of the systems that we have in Rolls Royce and yet they got, um, they got thrown into, I guess is the words I'm going to use, into a, new, a whole new set of virtual tools that we are using um, in light of the pandemic to support the remote workers we have, to give people a sense of community when actually they're probably in isolation and not working in comfort. You know, they're working maybe from their bed, they're working off a kitchen table. And we started to really think much more about the experience, not just the getting work done part of being able to deliver on some of the, the challenges, the tasks, the asks that we have in the space that we've got. And I think it's really interesting that all too often we'll fall on the technology side to say, well, great, we'll just use Teams or we'll just use Google Meet or we'll just use email or we'll, you know, start to use more virtual settings. But actually, that's only one part of this when you're trying to deliver customer services, especially within the data space, because to do um, hard computing or data science, 
you're already stuck in a screen, right? You're already doing that. So you need something that pulls you away and gives you a sense of the world. And so giving more tech tools to do that isn't really going to help. But then there's also this fact of, I've, I'm a new star and I've not even met anyone. And my first meet of them is a video screen. It's, it's a, I don't know whether what they're saying and what they're doing is really what they mean and what they say. Because when you collaborate physically versus virtually, I think we can all accept the big differences, massive, massive differences. And I know in one of the series, we've already covered uh, neurodiversity, and that's even more evident in the in the tech space. You know, you'll get more neurodivergent individuals within a tech sector than probably in a traditional retail sector. So when you're thinking about those types of bits and how they can play out, for me, that's massive. And that's now called for, that's now behavioural, and how you start to prepare both yourself and those around you to spot that, to know how to interact and how to observe some of that. It, I think that's a whole new paradigm that's coming through that probably a lot of us weren't aware of or never really had to worry about before. And it changes the dynamic of, of collaboration, and I, I certainly felt that a lot and looking at some of the questions that are coming through and i'm hoping these are kind of starting to certainly answer some of the bottom ones of how have we adapted through the pandemic and remote working um i think it's actually created greater collaboration for me but i didn't know where you were other than in, in your experience of what the last two years has seen when it comes to coming together collaborating working together um how has it been for, for yourself, particularly because you've worked in the ecosystem space and with suppliers, with customers and ourselves? I think I'll touch on two points there. One is around uh, inclusion, and I'm not just referring to ethnicity, sexuality, gender. That's definitely there as place is correct, but it's it's more than that. So if you strip that away from anyone, all humans to some level for me have something common that they share and it's about making everyone feel comfortable in this in this time so my personal story was before i'd schedule meetings when i'd have to go into a meeting room and there'd be enough time space in between or there'll be just occasional meetings where you'd be in between having meetings back to back to back to back just drives you nuts and you don't appreciate that a meeting is not necessarily getting work done and then there's work hanging off the back and that weighs down on my emotional health or when I commit to something I really want to get it done I don't want to let anyone else down and that means that I start working later and later and later and that tips the balance that I'm not happy at work I'm disengaged and end result is that the output isn't going to be as good as what I would have liked to give that was the first lesson that I learned pretty much six, seven, eight weeks into the into into the isolation period and the lockdowns and things like that. It was about taking breaks, making calculated um, slots in your day for thinking time, me time, off screen time, and then not just automatically resorting to calls such as Teams or Zoom, but actually having classical phone conversations where I can be chopping vegetables in the background because I need to get the cooking done as well. And there is a family I'm looking after and there is other things that I've got other commitments who make me me. So the whole of me is being respected and being put on the scale and I am work is one element of the whole me. And that's, I think, the first thing. The second thing is about being honest and upfront about my emotional um status or where i am today also to suppliers so it doesn't mean that's unprofessional it's done in a very professional way and a very calm collected articulated um appropriately but it is about saying where my head space is and where my heart is because a lot of suppliers will understand that and it gives them a chance to say actually you know what me too i've had so many people who turned around and said i'm glad you said that because my wife is stuck, my uh, my kids got COVID, I'm struggling with that as well. So you spend a little minute or two talking about that and you know you're on the same level before you start looking at work. And then all of a sudden that bond is a lot stronger because you're sharing the same pain. And I'm not saying every relation is based on pain, but it brings you a lot closer when you listen to each other. And this is one of the current topics why you would listen to each other. Um, so that's my experience on this. 
I'm just looking at the chat as well, going through. Um, yeah, um, about the initial experience and emotions where they were starting employment. Okay, so well, can you guys still hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so here's initial experience and emotions. What were they when I started employment at Rolls Royce? So my initial experience was I got asked to join Rolls Royce in 2019, just before the pandemic started. Um, it was interesting because you will see is the a bunch of the nicest people possible uh, because everyone's really friendly. Everyone's really, really courteous. People are defensive about their own subject area. So um, predominantly engineers. If there's something to do with the technology or, or their business area, they get very defensive and they've got long titles that they then tell you who they are. But it's one day I was on my way to a meeting and then I, I got, just got the meeting room completely wrong. And this person just took time out of the day, gave me the phone as a call to your person. You actually need to go to a different building. Another time I went to another building and I was again, I just asked someone for directions to the toilet. And they're like, oh, are you new? I'm going to give you a full induction. And they were about to take an hour out of the day just to help me most helpful people ever, completely non-judgmental, sometimes defensive, but I was struck by that because people just get on with work. There's low level of politics and there's less agendas being pushed than anywhere else where I've worked before. And that just means that you don't have to be on your guard. You don't have to be watching your back and you can just be honest about who you are and what you're struggling with and what you're strong in. And that is one of the things I, I learned at the beginning, and I just continue to be com uh, confirmed again and again and again. I mean, Manisha, you've been here longer than I have, and that's not to say something. Um, <laughs> what's your experience like? No, I think <laughs> um, no, I can I can definitely um, yeah, I can definitely agree and vouch for what you're saying. I guess one thing that we're conscious of is. Rolls Royce has really evolved in what it what it was doing before to what it's doing now. I mean, when it came out with Power by the Hour, it was so ahead of its time in what it where we were and what we were trying to do. And one thing that again, just trying to pull a few of these questions that are coming together, but also tie it back to the topic in the series topic. Um, we're always innovating, right? And our innovation comes from amazingly smart people on incredibly deep subjects but they're very finite in their subject. So, you know, thermodynamics of blah, 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 blah. And they'll know it inside out. Now, the problem with that is that in its own, it's brilliant if that's the only problem we had. But we tend to have lots of things because an engine is made of a lot of parts. And when you pull that all together, then suddenly it's not just that one part, it's the reciprocating impact that that part has on everything else. And so now you need a lot of experts together. And so, you know, 20, 30 years ago, whilst that was being done manually through some incredible brain power, we have introduced technology after technology after technology and more importantly, data to help us start to automate, to start to predict, to start to enhance and deliver new services that remove the, the, the hard work of that brain power so that it can look at new things that it can focus the brain power on. And the reason I'm saying that is that AI and analytics within Rolls-Royce has been um, a subject for 20 years. And so when I came in 10 years ago, I walked into an area that was already starting to get quite au okay with data. And so your points around being open to helping, although yours were different examples, also came with how can we make it better? How can we use the technologies, the innovations that are outside and specifically data science, computer science and AI and algorithmic knowledge to remove some of this burden on ourselves where we're having to manually calculate or use multiple spreadsheets or whatever and allow that to start to do it. So we're actually being the human in the loop to check, but now focusing where else can we use that technology? How else can we make it better for our customers, more effective for ourselves, more efficient? And now more importantly, with the kind of industry and the way that the world is going, which is so good to see is how can we make it more sustainable? How can we stop 
burning fossil fuels and increasing CO2 emissions and adding to electronic waste and causing some of the climate change that we're doing, but still make sure that at the heart of what we're doing is providing the power that matters. And so that's where I guess a lot of the bits for me has changed in the 10 years I've been here because the way that we've had to collaborate before was about bringing these unique people together because the problem needed those unique elements. And instead, we're going out in different industries. So we're pulling externals who sit in the space in, in space or who sit in geology or who sit in law and economics or retail. And we're saying the problem we have actually is similar to a problem you have. Because when you boil it down, it's about this. And it could be something to do with the circular economy. It could be to do with materials and access to materials or, you know, the mining or the creation of new hybrid materials or, or kind of chemicals, more importantly. And believe it or not, that's the same problem as you, because with this thing that you've got, you're going to need the same. So what if, crazy idea, we all get in a room and start to think about this together? And that's the space we have now entered. And that's what's been so beautiful, because when we talk about collaboration today, for actually Rolls-Royce, it's about residences. It's about bringing different units of community together and saying, how do we tackle this big problem, but using our examples to help feed the ideas? And that is an incredible space to be in. But back to your point of earlier of, Oh, but that's my space that's protected by me if i give you that what if you suddenly decide rolls royce that you want to go into retail fashion or what if rolls royce you've decided you want to go over here so there's a real thing about defensiveness and collaboration and understanding where the party lines are and how you can manage those most effectively and i think for me that journey and it's only been like I said, it's only been a decade is incredibly fast for what was typically quite a protected state that we all used to have. And for anyone who's not worked within a commercial setting of business, trust me, lawyers are there to protect you, but also to protect the very business that drives the revenue it makes. And that means things like IP, intelligence, anything that you've got in there, you know, they, they want to make sure that it's safe. But at the same time, collaboration is all about potentially opening that up. And so the whole world of open source, for example, for those of you who are, are exploring the technology space, is really starting to push the boundaries of that. And I think that's also changing the way we engage. We engage with people, both in our industry, as an employee base, but also outside in terms of other customers who we would have traditionally thought as competitors. And I, that's probably the thing that I would have, have said I've observed in coming into Rolls-Royce and what I've seen over the over the course of sort of 10 years or so but particularly in the last three or four it's been massive how about for yourself Art? i mean i don't i've kind of spoken quite broadly there yeah. but i think what we're doing today is really starting to bring alive some of that opportunity to change the way we collaborate i'm going to bring that opportunity to life with some examples because i'm going to take three different questions from the chat which we've gone through um and they are the last one I want to come to is, which is how can we practically go about encouraging development of those skills in the, behind the scenes where we're weaker? What Manisha mentioned, you don't need to lead from the front. Come to that last. Um, there are some challenging questions, but they keep reoccurring, which is actually really nice. It's about the value of AI. What are you actually guys doing? How can you actually make a difference? So it's about giving you an example of where we are actually doing it. Um, and then there is another one around do different areas in rural stories collaborate and what does collaboration look like and has the pandemic affected collaboration in a positive or negative way so i'm going to go with the example first then i'm going to give you the example of different parts of the company collaborating and what the pandemic has done and then i want to talk about um skills where you're weaker in um so ai a lot of you have asked now what do you guys actually do with AI? Does it actually make a difference or is it just fancy? Um, so it actually makes a difference for us. We have delivered over 420 million pounds of value through AI in different projects in Rolls-Royce. 
Uh, one of those that stands out a lot is in our supply chain, actually. So a lot of what AI does is it helps us compute the data that is so vast that it doesn't make sense for a human to do it anymore because it's too big, too much data is there for us to separate noise and value. So we work with AI to help us understand that. So this empowers inside the organization people to make decisions. And the people specifically here that I'm going to talk about are commodity buyers. So the first thing I want to say here is if you're going to talk about, say, an engine is made of metal, right? Uh, the way that the supply chain is set up for us, we've got um, we've got raw materials. So you get you get a smelter. They're the ones that make big, big metal cuboids of alloys so that these alloys, the composition is so amazing that they can to thermodynamics. They can be they can be in an engine where the temperature is so hot that's past their melting point, but they still don't melt. Right. So you've got those alloys that are lightweight, sturdy, everything. They go to a, a forger who then makes that into a smaller bull and the machinist. Now, these are three steps, three different people uh, or companies. And only after that does it go to supply and then does it come to us. So we've got multiple layers in our supply chain. This is basics for you guys. But the reason I'm saying this is because behind every step, there is a visibility lack. We don't know anything beyond our suppliers and maybe the suppliers of them of the, basically their suppliers. We do not know what happens behind that supply chain so far, which means that we don't know where they get shipped to, where they get sourced from. We have policies in the agreements like dual sourcing. So for example, if there's an earthquake in Japan that our supply chains don't get just wrecked, we need them from two different play, play, players. And we need to make sure that those two players don't get it from the same person as well. That's one thing. The other thing is what's the pricing. So all of this information is managed by our commodity buyers within Rolls-Royce, right? And traditionally, they do that a lot from experience and some of the tools that are available to them. They never had AI, ML do any calculations for them. And the way they buy raw, raw commodities is they meet in every quarter on conferences. And say the civil area, for example, they have engine projects. So the organization is split into by engine, project by project. So a commodity buyer buying raw material for a Trent 1000 engine with nothing to do with the Trent 700 engine would have nothing to do with the other ones, right? But the decisions of do I buy, how much do I buy, at what price still affect everyone else because people trading into us see us as one entity, not as a project by project. What And then what happens is when they do this five day program, they make a decision day one and that has an impact on day two, three, four, five as well. Now what we've developed is we've developed machine learning algorithms that build scenario modeling to a sophisticated degree. Scenario modeling has always been there. I know that, but they've built it to such a degree that it helps the commodity buyers do the mathematics within 45 minutes instead of doing it over five days to understand what the impact is on them, on their commodities for that day, for the next five days, and for other engine programs against the competitive landscape, against commodity prices, against the metal stock exchange and that kind of stuff. So it draws on all the information that's much, much more difficult to compute as a human to give a fair view. How does that affect transparency? Because through, through triangulating that information, they can make certain judgment calls now on suppliers and their suppliers and their suppliers. So what we did was we were able to stream, streamline how we get our uh, raw materials and the supply chain. So we were able to reduce the carbon impact by 40% just by being aware of what it is, where stuff comes from, we can influence our own footprint, things that we're responsible for and things that we might not be responsible for, but that we are part of. So then we stop being part of the problem because we're the, the entity at the top of the food chain asking for all this, but we've also helped those in the rest of the supply chain. We've helped them to reduce it in a way where it's gonna help the environment. So that's a practical example of how we use AI ML to help. That's only one area of the business, right? And it's still a multi-million pounds of value. But the value is, and someone asked, how do you measure, uh, how do you prioritize projects? We prioritize by impact, but impact is not only money. It's not only that, it's about also what social good it leads to do for the organization, but also for the wider world. So that's the first question with an example of how we use AI ML in our own organization to make a real difference that's measured in money, but also social good. Um, 
and that that's food for thought. We do other stuff like um, we did the AI for Good project where we help people with M and D to be able to get their voice back. So they don't talk really, but M people with M and D are people like Stephen Hawkins who lose their ability to speak, and then you have a machine very much like a, like a computer speaking. Now we were able to analyze with their permission their text phone text conversations. We were able to add character, humor, sarcasm, emotions to how they would speak so that it gives them one a sense of their their character and their their personality. But then also you can take sound bites of what they sounded like so that you can overlay that. So all of a sudden you can give someone a voice that they lost, right? No one's going to give them the voice chords back or the ability to control those. At least I think so. But it is using technology for a social good. And this is something that we do not charge for. It's something that we are we've given over um, at present to to our collaborators. It was again a collaboration with Dell and Microsoft and Google and a few other guys. And we're looking at how can we help the people with M and D um, to, to make use of that technology. There are loads of us now as I start talking that they're, um, they're sparking, but I'm not gonna I'm not going to linger too much on that. Happily to delve into it later if it comes up again. But I want to go to the second question now. And the second one was around how did the pandemic affect um, collaboration? Do different organizations in Rosses collaborate? Um, so like I said, like Manisha said before, they were less collaborative with each other because they had they were target driven and those targets set were personally for not personally but for their for their own departments of their own areas so civil state civil defense state and civil defense because the data wasn't allowed to be shared um you were not able to do you were not able to uh take anything out or know how it was all locked down with ndas and things like that so unfortunately we had to make a decision to roll um, in response to the pandemic we had to cut 9,000 jobs um, a lot of that was voluntary redundancies so we were able to support our own people some of them was by redeploying several people into defense and you automatically take a lot of know-how with you um, now power systems and civil and defense there are different programs going on so like dragon's den programs where people are able to come up with ideas and pitch them and take a small team forward prove these things but these things are happening due to the pandemic, but also despite the pandemic, because people have woken up to the fact that guard walls might not be making you as strong as you think, because they're not, everything happens inside and you don't know what the outside world is like and you start losing track of that. So within Rolls Royce, we're seeing it a lot more and more and more. The pandemic has forced us to go to an extreme and therefore we were able to break some of those things that had been there before. And you see beautiful examples in the, within the NHS now, a lot of things happen a lot faster where before it would take so much bureaucracy. And all of that red tape is just being cut because of the pandemic. And those are the kind of projects that we see now where different departments are working together, leadership is talking to each other, different people are being swapped around in different areas. Um, and yeah, that that you see that a lot. So that's the answer to that one. And I can see Manisha is actually already waiting. So I'm going to ask the last one from my side. And then I, Manisha, this is she's passionate about this topic as well, uh, about weaknesses and how do people develop? Because Manisha is actually a really, really good people developer. So weaknesses where you don't lead from the front. Um, it's about one being aware of what your weaknesses are. And very often I would actually argue it's what you don't enjoy. Um, if you enjoy something, getting good at it doesn't seem like a chore. So it's about accepting it and being compassionate with yourself, saying that, OK, this is not my strength, but there are other things that characterize me. Do I really need this? Are really asking yourself that. And if you do want to do something about it, then find a friend who can actually explain it to you. Very often, you don't need to do a degree in it. A YouTube video is enough to get to grips with it, to understand the things that you don't understand. You need someone to explain it to you in a way that you get it. And that's that's all, or oh, that's the most important first step, I will say, um, that matters. If you think about school, maths teachers, people either hate them or love them, and those who love them actually get on really, really well, and those who don't, traditionally don't do as well. It's because no one explained to you why you need to know it, or in a way that you want to know it. And that's really exciting someone and saying it in a way that, that means something to you is important. So you just need to find the person 
who can do it in that way so that automatically whatever your weakness is it turns into something that you're you're willing to practice in and it's the hours of practice that make the difference but you're gonna you're gonna have to ask yourself whether you actually want to put in the time or not don't do it because it's going to get you promotion or something because it won't make you happy long term it'll give you money yeah fine and a promotion it won't it might not make you happy because it's taking time away from something else that you might be more passionate about but if you want to bring up your weaknesses to a level where they don't disturb you anymore fine by all means find that person who's going to explain it in your language and that's very important but let me hand over to Manisha. um what do you how would you tackle it now i think you've you've answered that really really well um i think it is really important to understand if it's something you do need to do or not and also remember not everyone's an expert in everything and sometimes it's about the unique you know the, the bits that you're really good at that brings you out and and I think that's another part of working as an individual versus working within a group or with a, a collection of others is that it's your playing two strengths. You know, the whole point is play to the thing that comes most natural. And I think that's when you get really good thriving teams. Um, I'm, I'm having a, a couple of other questions here. So we've got one around how does Rolls Royce react to new and uh, innovative ideas and what steps can an individual take to make sure their idea is either heard or gone to the right team? And one of the things that Rolls-Royce has really, really pushed, I mean, like I said, I think a lot of organisations have these available, but sometimes you can never find it. Um, you tend to have like innovation rounds or innovation funding or cycles or teams, but sometimes it's not always clear or visible. And I think we've made a real avid effort, especially because of the fact that everyone's now no longer physically present, to make it more apparent, more or fronted almost in the organisation. So through our intranets, through programmes, um, through kind of messaging that we do. So we get weekly alerts that come out and newsletters that go to everybody in the company. And it's on there, it's always there as our innovation portal. And it's a place where you as an individual not only can submit, you can vote on others, you can nominate to get involved and help. And they're all channels that are funded, sponsored or supported. So it doesn't mean financially, it could be just time commitment um, by senior executives because they want people to be driving the innovation of the organisation. So their way of doing that is sponsoring that, being advocates of, promoting, supporting time to do. Um, and that helps either navigate something to a team or more importantly, get you to become part of that team. And I think that's the key here is that I think one thing we probably used to have before, and actually R Squared was guilty of this, I'm going to be honest, we were guilty of this. Um, we were the innovation catalyst, as, as I've said. So we were the centre of AI and sort of that more thought leadership. It's not to say it wasn't in our businesses. It's just to say that we were a hub that did it day in, day out. So for us, it was our main protocol of work. And so people used to come to us to get us to do work. However, when you've got an organisation of 45,000 people trying to come to 300 people, it's never going to work. You're never going to catalyse, as we call it, to really accelerate innovation within the AI and data space. Actually, what you want to do is bring them along too. So join forces, become together. And that means that they are part of it. They're not asking us to do it. They're saying, can you help us? Can you show us? Can you? So we became teachers. We became coaches. We became sharers of our knowledge. And I think when I think about the way that we collaborate now um, and what's here to stay is very much that. We use our tools and our technologies. So as a workforce, we're predominantly now hybrid. Um, I probably heard things, statements like that in the news. So most of the time we will work from home or from a remote location. Uh, again, I joked about beds and, and kitchens, but actually that can happen. Um, and depending on the nature of your job, you will then have the flexibility of being in an office or not. I believe an office is really important. Humans need humans. We are, a, you know, a species of... Um, a, a generation that's that thrived in family type atmosphere and actually it's a human need um, that you operate within and amongst a community and you'll find that isolation can really really pull you in and that's why so it's it's an innate human sense that you are somebody who likes to be around people whether you know it or not that's where our kind of ancestry came from 
And so being in an office really does give you that. It gives you a sense of there's others around me, there's a feeling that you can get from that that actually acts as a a way of motivating and driving you to do stuff, which is why, again, doing sports, doing activity, getting out is a really important part of working hybrid. And one of the things that is here to stay in the way that we collaborate amongst that then is we are obviously on a, a tech stack that allows us to do that. But one thing that we introduced, certainly in R squared, was platforms such as GatherTown or Spot. Now, these, I, th I saw someone put a reference to metaverse and making use of metaverse, and I'm sure that will come at time. It will find a way of being relevant. But actually, people don't necessarily want to virtualize their environment any more than it is today. They want the physical interaction. They want the real interaction. But what you can do is put playfulness behind some of this digital side of it, which is what platforms such as Spot and virtual office being relevant, but actually people don't necessarily want to virtualize their environment any more than it is today. They want the physical interaction, they want the real interaction. But what you can do is put playfulness behind some of this digital side of it, which is what platforms such as Spot and virtual offices and things do, because you avatar yourself in an environment where you can see others, you can interact as you would in a physical office. And I think things like that have really helped make the changes of how we work different and make sure that when we're coming towards innovation and the fact that who knows when this may end, you can still do a big meet, you can still gather together, you can still talk and collaborate, but it's not quite so full on as just a screen with yourself and another person, because actually that's really draining. It's really, really tiring if all you're seeing is yourself and others, because actually 20 to 40 percent of your time you're looking at yourself you are not observing what's going on in around you and therefore interacting with that and that's massive and I guess I raise that because actually there are behaviors around collaboration that you need to be thinking about it's not just a case of going say you please do what you can it's knowing when to pause it's knowing when to bring others in it's knowing when somebody's got a really good idea but no one's listening and that's quite difficult when you're virtual to physical, which is why I still think, again, a question that was raised earlier, I do still think you get a lot more out of a physical collaboration than a virtual one, because all those hidden things that happen below your head, you can see all those feelings that you're getting off someone, you can feel Whereas you cannot do that on a virtual setting, you are having to make a lot of judgments, assessments and assumptions. And so I would say that that physical being together is a lot, lot more effective than a virtual one. But I think there's a lot more technology that's coming in to see that change as well. So I thought I'd just answer a couple of those types of questions of, that I can see coming through. Um, I've seen a number number of others, and Arthur, there's one specifically about your role, and it sounds magical. So maybe you might want to answer that one, because I think it is magical, personally. I love your role. It's <laughs> great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll ask two, which came as misnomers. Um, and then there's one around Oscar Data Labs in terms of professional background, all that kind of stuff. And then there is also ethics. Ethics is a big, big, big one that I think both of us have a lot to talk about. Um, so the storytelling, the, the question that you that you um, just raised. Storytelling is not a common term that has a defined job description, is, is the honest answer. My take on storytelling is anything where you have a, hi Sunil, uh, where you have a, that's not even Sunil. <laughs> Uh, anything where you have a um, where you have a way to bridge the gap between a communication gap, right? So, for example, if I have a lot of engineers in one space and then a lot of business people on the other space, how do you break down defense mechanisms, get people to understand each other, make sure it's the message that comes across and they're not caught in all sorts of frictions? And that is all that storytelling is. It's making the message come through in the best way possible. Storytelling is just an innate way of how we've passed down message from generation to generation. And that was even before we had writing. You sit around the campfire, you start reciting things, people start thinking. So I give masterclass on storytelling and there is a whole science behind why storytelling is still there today. But 
there is not this longest story since the 1920s or something like that. It, it made me smile when you wrote it, and it's quite nice the way you see it. It's not quite the way I see it. For me, storytelling is in the quality of the interaction rather than the quantity. Um, it's the way you say it as opposed to the actual story itself. It's it's the narration of it, I would rather say. So that's why I'll focus on on that question. Um, yeah, that one would, would be ideal. Uh, I'll come back to ethics. I just want to talk about credibility of Oscar Data Labs briefly because we we didn't come on this call to show off or to, to talk about credibility or things like that. Um, we've got an amazing host of brainy people and they're not just um, PhD holders. Even, even our very most recent recruit who used to be an intern has just published a paper um, on ethics and we can we can come to that. But she's she's gotten that accolade and she's recently been um, approaches doctor, which she obviously isn't, but that's the kind of caliber who we have in the team. When you're passionate about something, and she wrote a paper on how ethics and AI ethics and oncology sit together. So in the in the area of cancer research, how do you how do you bring in AI? And that was just because she was passionate about it. Uh, we have people who've presented the King of Jordan on robotics and self-driving helicopters. We've got people who uh, studied the, the COVID g uh, genome and looked at protein stains and looked at sequencing and how to use computer vision for that. Um, we've got so many different disciplines in there from robotics, computer vision, new natural language processing. Um, and they, they are just top crop that they're just top of the game because they constantly research and understand and publish and peer review and i don't want to go too much more into the accolades but if you guys are interested please do reach out to us manisha or me or even any of the other email addresses find us on linkedin very very happy to to have chats in general um but yeah so that, that's the team and now on ethics um not last December, but the December before. So that was 2020, right? Yeah, 2020 December, we created something. That's the Aletheia framework. And that is our ethics framework for using AI safely, transparently, all that kind of stuff. It's a self-governing framework where every company can take it themselves or individuals, and they can check whether AI is doing good or bad in simple terms. That's not how we position it, but in simple terms. It was presented in the House of Lords by our group um, director, Karen Gorski. It was reviewed, peer reviewed by various other organizations, uh, Professor of Oncology, which we collaborated on as well. Um, Alexander Mann Solution, for example, is someone who, who we've taken forward as a, um, as, a, as a public collaborator on that one and looking at how you take bias out of recruitment. Um, and this framework essentially is our approach for other people to build on and develop and say, you go through this and you use it to see, are you doing good or bad? Is, is this something a reason for concern? And one of the areas in there is like, are you killing jobs, for example? The other area is, are you creating jobs? What are you doing? How can you, how can you be bias free? What's transparency? What's, what's, can you check the AI rather than it's a black box? And some of those things are very, very important because they they're currently not answered they can't there's no way of approaching it at the moment and what we did was something that even like the metropolitan police who were looking into face recognition they had to stop that program uh were meriting us on because it helps us to think about robotic inspections of engines and things like that so yes it comes from an engineering background but like Manisha said, we're developing building stuff that should hopefully help the rest of the world across other verticals, other sectors, other areas. And we've made that available for free uh, Creative Commons license on our website so anyone can download it for free and use it. Uh, we're iterating it. We've literally made something available in its raw format. We're iterating it every day more and more and more to make it more and more accessible. Um, but again, that's something where we call out for collaboration, where we say, guys, come and work with us on this. It's approved, it's done, uh, it's a stepping stone. And there are so many there. UNESCO, for example, is, is looking into it. There's so many different people. I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say that. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. If I say more, then I'm not allowed to. <laughs> then I'm allowed to. I love it. It always gets there, doesn't it? We always get into that. Oh, God, can I say this? Can I not? Well, I've said it now. Yeah. It's too late. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think again, uh, ethics is becoming a, a bigger, bigger thing as is sustainability. And I've seen a number of questions around sustainability, our net zero plans, 
and renewable technologies. You know, we go back to that point that, that Aravind said, you know, we are kind of focused on the power that matters. And that power that matters has to be sustainable going forward. You know, we, we're killing the earth if we keep digging. And so a lot of the focus of our net zero strategy is around how do we turn to SAF fuels? So that is our um, fuels that are more renewable. How do we then make sure that the engines that we operate can cater for that? As well as looking at alternative fuels, because again, it doesn't just have to be a SAF fuel. We could go into the world of hydrogen and there's a lot of, a lot of talk and thinking around that and engaging with research. Um, to understand how will that affect the way that our engines would need to operate. Um, is there a realistic route to get that level of fuel coming through as well? Because it's not just about how you use it, it's whether you can actually get hold of it. Um, and then the other question that got raised further up, um, and I'll tie this in. So another aspect of renewability we're looking at is we do a lot within power grids and thinking about how we can take the energy of the sun and start to use that to drive new power, as well as um, our small modular reactors, which has been in the press recently because we've gained some more funding and sponsorship to support those projects. We're thinking about that kind of circular route of how sustainable is it, how renewable is it, and are we talking about just the power source itself or everything that enables that power source to be generated? And I say that because I saw the question around, hang on, you guys deal with a lot of data. Does that not mean you need more data centers? And so therefore, how are you managing that? Because surely in one hand, you're saying you're doing this, but in the other, you're increasing your power consumption. You're absolutely right. And so we are looking at and working with data center commodities and, and organizations to say, actually, what is the future of things such as um, blockchain and other technologies and are they going to be a problem you know do we really want that not only from a security and a safety point of view but actually from a power and a consumption point of view and so again as we start to make use of data are we do we need to keep it all how do we make sure we're managing it and being ethical and governing the data that we're driving and the power that is required for that and how can we be intelligent around how we resource that power whether it be fueling it back in so it's providing heating lighting or using it from generation systems or others and so what it started to do is really allow us to open up those conversations as i mentioned we would previously be talking to a Microsoft, a Google or an AWS about their technology platform. We're now asking them, do you want help with your power consumption? Because we've got intelligence and algorithms that can help you. And that's a very different place to be than where we were before. I think that's a really, really different place. And so what I would do is encourage anyone who wants to know a little bit more around our net zero plans and some of the new technology spaces we're working in to definitely go visit our website, um, rollsroyce.com website, because it's all up there on the homepage. And we put very, very implicitly what we are committing to um, as we go through those net zero plans of ours. The last one that I wanted to touch on, and again, I saw it in some of this, was around just some of that replacement of engineering of and capability through AI. And will, will the engineers of the future become reliant on tech rather than their own knowledge and intelligence? So the first one on um, engineers becoming more, more reliant on technology, I think if I'm going to be honest, it's semi-given, right? If you think about and probably ask your parents and your grandparents, how did they use the mobile phone when it first came out? To you, it's probably an extension of your arm, right? It's just, it's given, it's there. In fact, if it's not there, oh my God, what did I do with it? For them, it was just a thing that allowed them to do something that they didn't really do before or now can do a little bit easier. Hold on. It's something they used to switch off at night. Yes, exactly. That's, that's yes. And you wouldn't worry about Wi-Fi. And you definitely wouldn't need to have a charger with you, uh, you know, or a power bank to make sure that it's got enough juice. Um, but I like that. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> you turn it off at night. Um, and the reason I say that is there's some things that we've just all got accustomed to and we get used to. And I think the engineers of the future will get accustomed to technology doing certain things for them, given, right? It's the same with the calculator. Right? Yeah, I think schools now accept that you're going to use them for a lot of things. They will still teach you the theory, though. 
And I think the important part here is that when I think about our engineers of the future, they will absolutely need to know the theory because there will always be a human in the loop. We will always need to check. We've got to have a, and part of the Aletheia framework is, is about that check. How can you, what is it that's ensuring that you've got enough trust in what's going on, that there's control points to stop it and it doesn't go out of hand? Because as you know, artificial intelligence learns as it goes. So it needs something to help it. And so I think there's that balance of, yes, they will become more accustomed to it, but no, they will still need to absolutely use their no power. And actually that knowledge is now being applied in a different way. So it will uncover new things that will keep their brains busy. And so that's what I love about it. It's evolutionary rather than it being just complete replacement. And I think the, the last one is again around um, just that, that future world of all of this. I guess for us, we, we're quite open, right? We're, we're looking to the future, thinking about where it could lead. And there's some exciting places. There's some genuinely exciting places. But I cannot emphasise the importance of diversity in ensuring that that is then embraced. And I saw a number of questions around how does Rolls-Royce embrace diversity and what does it do and, and how does it cultivate that? We have a huge range of things that are in place to drive that forward. And I guess for me, when I think about all of the different parts, and again, this is all available on the um, kind of on, on some of the uh, website pages. Um, a lot of that is around our employee resource groups, around everyone that is um, coming in and kind of coaching back to that coaching and teaching of others to bring it through, as well as a lot of the other parts of what this organisation does in some of its um, diversity metrics and diversity initiatives because that's what we need to ensure we take on the full challenge of the year. And I think that's a nice place to end. Um, it feels like we've kind of come full circle because we started about our people and the, the importance of that. We've come back to the people and the importance of that. So I don't know about you, all, but I've thoroughly enjoyed this and I think we've had an absolutely brilliant set of questions. So thank you everyone for sharing those. Um, I'm gonna personally thank everyone uh, for attending. And I um, hope you've signed up for the next one, more importantly, or if you haven't seen the other ones, definitely go check them out because there's there's lots of inspirational conversation there. But I'll leave off for you to maybe close out the session. Yeah, very happy to. So as Manisha said, there is a power series hub that you can sign up to, or if you hang out just after we finish here, then there'll be a link on your on the page on the screen as well. But I also want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for turning up and listening to us and all your questions. I like questions that are challenging where I can see that someone's put some thought into it. And in this power series, definitely we've seen a lot of challenging questions coming through and it keeps us honest. It also shows that there is enough people out there who want to join us and who want to make a difference, um, who, don't, who don't just want to believe what they're being told. And that is super important. Um, and yeah, it just fills me with hope. It just fills me with hope that there are enough people out there who can come and want to make that difference. And, and that is something that I really, really embrace. Um, so thank you very, very much. Uh, wish you all the best for any journey that you go on with us, without us, around us sooner or later. Um, but yeah, like Manisha said, we are very, very much looking forward to the future. Technology is always a tool. You can use it for good or bad. Um, so we're very, very interested in how to use it for the good. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you.